And on this very sunny and hot uh, day again in uh, in London, I'm um, joined by um, yeah someone uh, who really admire, respect, and um, we've got to know each other through through the years um, in person actually. And this is one of the rare live streams where uh, the person uh, in front of us uh, I've actually met in person a few times at uh, at a few meetups and uh, at a few maths cons. So. Um, Welcome to the live stream, um, yeah, Sudeep. Um, how would I pronounce your surname for us to go for that? Uh, oh, no, that's uh, uh, Gokarakonda. Gokarakonda. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I don't use it uh, at school and things. I always just went for Gokar, uh, just for the first two syllables, rather foolishly, because uh, that then just opened me up to all the go-karting type jokes. Um, I never thought it through, uh, but yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, it's like a uh, real, real sort of honour to be be on uh, one of your chats. Um, yeah, very much looking forward to it. Yeah, and of course we know you as Sudeep, uh, uh, Boss Mats man, really. Or, you know, I've uh, even heard you being called Boss Boss Mats at a conference because I didn't know your real name or something like. Um, so yeah, maybe you can um, just let us know some, uh, you know, what some of your background is, how you got into maths teaching, and what you currently do as well. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. So the viewers, there'll be plenty of viewers on Twitter and uh, Facebook where this is streaming who, who yeah, who don't know about you at all actually. So yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I guess from a teaching point of view, uh, I started teaching in two thousand and eight, um, and I did that for a couple of years. Um, and for various reasons, I decided actually to leave teaching. Um, and I went off and became an accountant. And I worked for uh, an organization called the National Audit Office. So they're effectively the organization that reports to parliament on how various government organizations are doing. Um, but that really wasn't for me. So I uh, then returned to teaching. Um, and I've only ever taught in schools in, um, in London, so both uh sort of comprehensive uh, academies um yeah uh i mean before that i uh i studied maths at cambridge um and then i did a master's in environmental policy um, and environment is actually a very sort of big passion of mine as well uh as maths and i do kind of think oh maybe i need to go back in that direction um so i was like kind of there's too many things to do in life not enough time almost um so yeah, that's, that's sort of my background from before. Um, and as I sort of alluded in, in a tweet I put out earlier, I didn't actually grow up from birth in this country. I was born in India. Uh, so I had a bit of experience of, of you know, an education system abroad uh, and then sort of moved here at the age of nine and sort of did the rest of my schooling over here. All right. Well, that's that's fascinating. So, uh, I mean, I say it's fascinating because uh, when you see what you post on Twitter, is it's you've got such a firm grasp of the language around mathematics and language in general. And uh, is that perhaps maybe in, when uh, certainly for me, like I very similar to you, I came to the UK at the age of fifteen. So, I've, uh, for me, English um, became a first language much later on. So, I've had to like kind of learn it from well first principles in some ways so I like really have to f think about what the words mean and is that is that the sort of thing I mean how did you get into this kind of very sort of linguistic analysis part of uh... Uh, I, I mean I'm not I, I'm not really an expert on that kind of thing I'm just I'll call myself an enthusiast I'm just really interested and curious so I look things up all the time um, and you know it could be considered a, a distraction really um, in terms of English, it is really my first language. So even in India, it might not have been my first spoken language, um, but uh, it's the only one I learned to read and write um, from a young age. And then only when I was a bit older did I start to learn uh, sort of my mother tongue language, as it were, uh, reading and writing. But it's sort of something I don't use, so I probably can't even read uh, sort of the, the, the language my parents speak. You know, I certainly can't write it um, anymore. So yeah, English. Uh, yeah, fortunately, uh, considering I live here, it is, it is really my first language. Right, right. Well, we've got uh, Shivan and actually Tiwari from uh, Delhi tuned in. He says, uh, hello, Atul and Sudeep, sir. Uh, he's a maths teacher in, in Delhi, so uh, talking about all the, all the language and uh, all that, so that's, that's great. So if you happen to be on Twitter or on Facebook, uh, yeah, just 
throw us any question uh, or let us know where you're tuned in from where you are we like to get this we, this is this is this is really your show in some ways because the we can of course just record this and put it on youtube but uh you know it wouldn't be the same because we want we want you to interact with us and give us some questions and um yeah Okay, so uh, yeah, I suppose we could move on to uh, some uh, some of the boss mats things uh, that you do. Um, so yeah, you could you could run through what the or like the popular part of society is or what boss mats is because there's obviously viewers that uh, aren't yeah, familiar I mean, with it. Yes. Sorry, sorry. To interrupt. Um, you know, it might be uh, interesting if I sort of tell you what was behind it, and uh, you know, actually, I'm someone naturally very very reluctant to be to be sharing things online um i mean i'm a massive introvert and there's sort of so many reasons not to do this um uh and that sort of had to be pushed into it a little bit and actually i'm really grateful for the way things have turned out um but yeah basically if, if i tell you the story behind it yeah, um, sure. yeah absolutely i so it was back in sort of 2013 i think um the school that i hadn't yet joined um decided that they were going to buy iPads for every single child. Um, and of course, this was 2013. So these were actually iPad minis, tiny little things, uh, no retina displays. They just bought a load of these at huge expense for every every child. Um, I joined that school in 2014 um, and found myself in a situation where, because they'd spent all this money on, on iPads, um, kind of decided, right, textbooks out. We don't, you know, we're not going to use those. Everything's going to be on the iPad. Um, and I won't name names, but we subscribed to a online, an online textbook. Um, and it was just a horrendous, horrendous user experience uh, because, first of all, the child had to log in to this textbook. It wasn't, it wasn't one that worked offline. It wasn't an app or a sort of iBook or anything like that. So they had to log in. So you know, going to this website, making sure all the Wi-Fi was working in all the classrooms and everything like that. And once you logged in, you didn't just get onto the textbook. You had to click probably six or seven times, about six or seven page loads, just to get to the right page. And then when you finally got there, what you got was just a sort of facsimile of the, the print book. Um, now, as a teacher, I had a copy of the print book because it's just handy to have, you know, to take home and things. Um, and because it was just a facsimile of this print book, it wasn't formatted to be sort of easy to use on a small screen, uh, certainly not on a low resolution screen. Mm. So the kids were constantly zooming in and out uh, just, to, just to be looking at it. It was just a terrible, terrible user experience. Um, and at the time, 2014, um, some of the great, great things that are out there now weren't really an option um, in terms of platforms and, and, and so yeah, things like that. Um, and where you could get worksheets online, a lot of them would be PDFs that are, you know, they keep the formatting correct, but even PDFs, they would generally be A4 PDFs. So just not ideal to use on these devices. Um, and, and that was just this frustration. It's like, what was wrong with textbooks? You know, you tell someone to go to page 73, they're there in seconds, you know? Yeah. Tell someone to go to page 73 on this online thing, it's just insane. Um, so I started putting things together um, in a way that I knew would work in that situation for me and for my colleagues. So we had these, I mean, if you go on boss mats, you'll you see the stuff should be legible, um, certainly the slides on even a mobile phone screen. Um, and, and that's really where it started. But it wasn't meant for anybody else to use. Um, and it wasn't meant to be something that suited, you know, filled in all the, you know, that, that filled in everything you might want as a maths teacher. It was just something that made a big difference at the time for those of us in that department. Um, yeah, so that, that was kind of the, the real story behind it, uh, why it started. I mean, I've rambled on there, but... No, 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 that's great. I mean, you can, uh, yeah, it's really interesting to hear because often what uh, we don't realise is when we see a site, um, you know, this, the maths community is extremely lucky for... Um, all these various resources and websites but uh, and what we often see is this finished product you know if we if i just use corbett maths as an example um yeah, there's like hundreds of worksheets and videos and you see you see that finished product but you very rarely realize how how much work went into it and it was got to be a phenomenal amount of work and it has to be 
I'm sure it's evolved through feedback and then partly through trial and improvement. So I think it's so so important to hear that, like you know how what you put into it and how you how you improved it. Um, so cl- clearly, I think it was just between you and your department right in the beginning, and then like, something. Yeah, something I mean, about it. it was it was largely like, it was me. I mean, I wasn't. No one else was creating stuff there. I don't think. You know, so I'm not saying that in a negative way. Uh, I was just crazy enough to think, I'm not happy about this. So I'm going to do something about it. Um, but really, I had no intention of sharing it more widely. Um, and sort of the mindset I had was that, and to an extent, I still do it. So it almost feels arrogant to share something when there's already so much good stuff out there. It's like, who do I think I am to to like create something and add, add stuff out there? So I really had to be sort of, encouraged to do it when people said you know what other people might like to use this um yeah uh so that that's kind of where it's got to uh, how it's got to where it has or at least from the early days yeah yeah, yeah i would really encourage um teachers tutors etc to make content and like put it on the website uh, i think this i had the same reservation i started a youtube channel about a year ago and um, it was like really, really slow to take off. It's the same with my website. It's like, uh, and in some ways, like why am I putting this out there? Like this amazing websites, like I have all, all the information I could ever need. Uh, but uh, we, then initially I was doing the website just for myself actually, really, because I, I need to access that resource and I need to click on that thing that I really like. And I also need to, articulate to myself like what this bit of teaching is why why i think it's good and by doing so it and like knowing that it's actually technically in the public domain my presentation skills have to be sharp and i have to be very clear about what what i'm trying to say otherwise it's in my head or i've done it with my duty and and that's and that's lost in the moment and uh, you know everyone's got a unique spin or a take it's the same concept it's the same idea but the way you present it and what you may also be doing is you are someone who collates the information uh, there's just just a haze of information out there like you know all the all the stuff that you've been doing about about the language and maths of course it's out there uh, but what you've what you've done is like brought it together into like one place and and like channeled it so everyone's not just creating content but they are actually also funneling it so so to speak or like creating new content isn't creating it from scratch it's like finding all the other content out there and collating it and then presenting it and everyone does that like every teacher does that they have their own way in collating and presenting that information so i I can't recommend that enough and um i know it's the same with video for me um like video is a very rich medium of communication and of course we are now in this pandemic time where a lot of teachers have been just forced to make videos for their own pupils uh, and it's not it's not a it's not a bad skill actually because in a video you have to present you have to present your idea very clearly and you have to articulate it and it's open to feedback as well so you know I, it's, it's it's a great idea and um okay so okay. Yeah. Can I just echo what you're saying there? So just if there is anybody watching who has maybe been thinking about sharing some stuff out there, whether it's, you know, make their own blog or website or just um, share, sharing things on Twitter, uh, but they've got some reservations, uh, I would just really, really, really recommend it. It's um, it's a brilliant thing to do just for yourself, like even if initially nobody's engaging with it. Um, like I say, there's, there's so many reasons not to do it. Like for me, I said there's sort of the feeling that, oh, it feels a bit arrogant. And then another one is, um, you know, everyone's time limited. So I'm one who's always, I'm never happy with anything I've done. I always think if I had more time, I would have done that better. So, you know, you're putting stuff out there that you could have done better. And, you know, you're just thinking, well, what, what, you know, people are going to judge that even though it's not necessarily my best work. And even more the case for me now, um, I think, a lot of it, because there's just so much content on, on Boss Maths, um, I'm not in a position that I can update everything sort of at, you know, overnight, um, which means there's a lot of stuff on there that is reflective of what I was thinking maybe a few years ago. Um, and even if I do want to change it, 
it's sort of difficult to do during the year because some you know there's enough traffic on the site now that someone might you know go on there on a monday night and think i'm going to use that on tuesday so i can't then go and update it um easily without sort of confusing people potentially so i kind of feel like okay i've got to wait till the summer holidays before i do some some big updates to things um so i can do additions but i can't really go and change all those things so there's that like what are people going to think all of that kind of negative those negative voices but the positives are just huge you know you get feedback people are really kind like they they'll give you useful feedback if you ask for it um you know uh i mean sometimes you you know you'll get a lot of people using it without giving you any feedback which which is you know natural i guess because people are busy but you do get some and that's invaluable um it's just great cpd it's just great cpd like you get you get a more diverse range of, of voices um then just sort of maybe the people in your department um that have thoughts that you've never considered um and yeah it's just it's just such a good thing to do um it, it will make you a better teacher by by sharing stuff that you've thought about and it doesn't need to be huge quantities you can just do the odd sort of activity and there's loads of great places that sort of accept contributions as well so you don't have to sort of create your own site from scratch you can go and share something with one of uh, you know Craig Barton's websites or um you've got kind of Pete Mattox and uh, Ashton Cowles so you've had them both on haven't you um yeah. you had Ashton on Ashton yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. More, uh, more same less you know create a grid for them and, and and send it off to them and and you know uh people people will use it and and how great is that yeah yeah absolutely yeah now I fully know what you mean about the website being out of data like the core bit of my website is for 5 years out of date and I've like I've changed so much as a maths tutor in the last 3 years alone I have to like feel these videos no longer represent me like I I know so much more now like I need to tear them down but it takes quite a bit of time to replace it and make something coherent so uh, but it's cool. It's like um, it's nice to see um, an older version of myself and compare where 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 I am. And everyone's in this state of development. In five years' time, you look at yourself now, and um, yeah, it's all great. So yeah, one of my uh, personally one of the things I like using about on your website is um, because I teach completely online. Um, I really like your GeoGebra stuff because it's interactive. It's dynamic geometry. It's on screen. My duties are on screen. Now everyone's teaching on screen anyway so in in some ways like producing all that geogebra stuff all that time back is now is really valuable to the community because you've got it there and it's really needed on screen all the time um so yeah it'd be really cool if you could uh, show you uh, if you could show us some of the 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 most popular stuff you think is on the on geogebra related uh, yeah um okay uh let me share, shall I, well, before I share my screen, actually, if I just sort of mention, I think a lot of the, there's, there's sort of two types of GeoGebra applet I've got on the site. Some are sort of intended to help you visualize um, a certain topic or concept. Um, but a lot of the things on there, they're just um, sort of for um, just random, random question generators. Uh, so for me, that was something I've used a lot. It wasn't, you know, I've, weren't necessarily on the website from the beginning. I would just sort of make them on GeoGebra and um, and then sort of run them from there. But I've started adding sort of my sort of big library of GeoGebras, sort of updating them and putting them on the website. Uh, so yeah, let me let me share my screen. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I see how the screen share goes. Um... Yeah. So I don't know if we take something like like this. Um, for me. So this this is just something that generates random questions. It's not the only website that does something like this. Mm. Uh, but I think maybe sort of five, six years ago, there were, it wasn't, weren't that many obvious choices, to me anyway, um, of where you could go for question generators. And I'm someone that is really, really big on mini whiteboards. So this is obviously, I'm talking in a classroom rather than online. Um, you know, I've had grief from uh, sort of senior leadership, people doing book scrutinies and that kind of thing, you know. Um, saying where's the work in the books and, and you know I do get kids doing work in the books but I get so much done on mini whiteboards um, mm. and I've seen some interesting discussions on, on Twitter about this uh, but for me it's just a way of it's almost actually you'll know this if, if you've got a student who's struggling you're not going to leave them for 10 minutes because you know you're one-to-one -one with them you will you will break things down for them or you will 
you know, maybe explain the same concept in a different way. You'll deal with it very quickly. You'll notice if they've got a question and they're, they're, they're struggling to move on with it. Um, and of course, in a class, you might do an example. You might, you know, ask a few few people individually and then set some work. But then maybe you've got two kids here who are struggling and you go and sit with them and you try to explain to them. But you might have someone on the other side of the room who doesn't get it and, and you're not dealing with them. Um, so like, yeah, just mini whiteboards for me are huge. Um, and it yeah. was, it, sometimes it's nice to have a set of questions, but what if you kind of run out of them and, and they haven't quite got it and you want to generate more? So that's why just having random questions that you can generate and, and just show the answers to, uh, I just find, you know, really useful. And it's like, okay, if they've got it and, and I'm confident, I'll be like, yeah, you've all got all of these five. Let's, um, you know, get on with the your sort of book work. Um, but if not, like, just have some more. Here's some more, like, what do you think? Or what's on the, you know, write, write it on your mini whiteboard. Uh, so think, things like that. Um, and then there are a few things that I think um, are a bit more, uh, again, a bit less common on some of the other random question generators, certainly the free ones, um, is that a lot of them have, a lot of the ones out there are focused on, say, number and algebra type questions. So they don't really uh, necessarily give you a lot in the way of diagrams. So if I go to something like perimeter area volume, um, I've got this. This is one of the more popular pages. It's called Top Topics. Right. And the idea is these are just kind of the procedural questions um, where they're just basic things that, that kids need to know. Um, and you can kind of raise the difficulty We're using this slider. Um, and, you know, you can create a grid of, you know, six of these or three of these or four of these, however many you want. Um, mm. I can enable more uh, down here. Let me get the most. I will just do three. Uh, so I've got got various things, and I can just sort of say, right, here's a more difficult one, um, things like that, you know, with area and perimeter uh, volume, you know, I've got something right up to sort of spheres, um, and you can just sort of do a bunch of questions like this, um, and you know, if they're getting it wrong, you can sort of show the answer and then just generate a new one and say, right, have a go at this one. You can obviously having explained it. So as a kind of starter or um, just some kind of interlude where you want to just give them a bunch of questions on, say something you did last lesson last week. That's kind of a popular. Yeah, space way. learning. It could be any anything. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. just sort of something from a, from a year ago. Just you choose a sort of broad topic and you think, right, uh, let's make it this difficult. Uh, there's the nth term. We can go to um, nth term quadratic type um, questions. You know. Mm. So yeah, there's that. So those are kind of the random question generators, mm. um, and then I've kind of got some slightly more conceptual type questions. Uh, I wanted to go for the mean here. Um, mm. I totally so, agree with your mini whiteboard thing, actually. I, re I love mini whiteboards. I, in fact, uh, sometimes uh, some of my tutees, if they happen to have them online, uh, I use them online, actually. I've been trying to tell some tutors slash teachers that um, high tech isn't always the answer. You don't necessarily need an electronic whiteboard. Um, uh, children really like this kind of temporary working space that is big in text and they can erase and write again and hold up and it's great on camera as well because it's it's written big they can just hold it up on camera and i can see what they are i can take a screenshot and then put it on a bit of paper and work on it but it's a really really versatile working space i think it's like it's a working space it's a different working space where you kind of throw out your ideas and are not afraid to make mistakes because you can rub it out very easily and then the, the textbook maybe where you do the more consolidated stuff so yeah totally totally fully on board with mini whiteboards online as well online and uh, in the classroom yeah and, and yeah yeah um i mean i know there's some so it's got some big advocates uh like emma mccray for example i think in, in in a book um makes a big deal about mini whiteboards um i absolutely hated them actually back in 2008 when i started but it wasn't the mini whiteboards it was really behavior um so it was just you know i mean i just sort of got to a stage where i sort of felt like I was on top of my classes, but they were still on a knife edge. Getting the mini whiteboards out was just an excuse for them, you know, writing silly messages to each other and throwing pen lids or losing pen lids and, and things like that. Uh, so yeah, it took me a long time to sort of really appreciate them. Um, but yes, yeah, sort of going back to these GeoGebras, um, so something like this, uh, you know, and I think, I think I've even heard you talk about these before, you know, just demonstrating the mean, um, you know, like just sort of rearranging these blocks. Can I can I get them into the same same height? You know, it's just sort of a little bit nicer to, to do it physically. Um, 
obviously you can do it with you, know, you can use some multi-links or whatever but it's just nice to have on a screen if you don't have some physical blocks to play with um and then there's some where trying to get a bit of variation in um something like this so here i've got the mean of these numbers you can sort of show the mean as leveling out those blocks but then we can ask the question right what's what would happen if i add one to say this value here what's going to happen to the mean can you predict what will happen um you know and a student might you know might get it right they might not but we can show right that's that's increased it by by a fifth um if i take that away and say right what would happen if i add one to every single one of these values like what's going to happen to the mean it's like all oh, right the whole mean goes up by one uh what's going to happen if i double all of these so there's just some little things that you can do quite quickly um hmm. using just some some button clicks um and it's a bit of a pain to say draw these out or prepare all of these in advance um so yeah there's there's something like you know these ones that 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 sort of yeah proved to be popular um one of the things i was talking about actually at, at matt's conf on saturday was um transformations um and then uh peter matic was also talking about transformations so it was quite gratifying and he had some very similar ideas to me or i should say i had some oh. ideas to him whichever way around it is um but like about sort of using vectors um as, as as a way of thinking um into these things so you know if i want to uh does that go full screen or yes that, yeah just want to go back to that uh, leveling the towers thing actually it's um yeah it'd be amazing it's amazing like how many people's mind don't understand that calculating the mean is actually in effect it's leveling those towers it's actually a leveling of it's a spreading out of data so that everything becomes averagely the same um, because what they obviously learn is take the number of numbers and add them by the total number of numbers find the total and then divide by the total number of numbers and this kind of they don't actually know what the mean means and for, weirdly enough i i looked around and the true meaning of mean as the spreading out of this data you find it somewhere on that further maths a level where it's like the integral and there's like a straight line with the area of the rectangle and uh so it's really good that that visualization i use it um and i do that with my very young pupils because then they they realize right from a very early stage because then they realize actually yes the mean is the leveling everything becomes the same on average so when it comes to one of those questions where you added another person who scored three goals what's the new average well kind of know this basically it's going to be yeah it's leveling again so uh, it's a really it's a really good resource yeah yeah i mean if i just show you one more maybe um since i've got it open um another geogebra so this one is the kind of thing it's a pain to do like certainly um on a, on a normal whiteboard, um, which I have to say, by the way, uh, people are very surprised to hear. I, I actually am not a big fan of technology generally. Like I, I use tech to augment, but sort of try not to make it the default. Um, so uh, I don't know, like if you've seen some of, some of the videos that I've got on the site, there's a lot of them with me writing on a glass board. Like, you know, writing on a whiteboard to me is a million times better than writing on a on an interactive whiteboard. And PowerPoint, I just, just never use it in the classroom. Um, so and you know certainly when there's lots of transitions on slides i know some people like that but it's not for me um so like the most i would ever want on a slide is just a set of questions and then i'm going to write everything on a, on a white but with say something like enlargement it's a real pain to do on a board um you know especially if you're gonna have to rub things out and draw a new one on um and with say a visualizer or a document camera uh you can still do it it's quite good in some ways to show students exactly what they need to do um but sometimes it's just easy to think all right i'm gonna I'm just going to, you know, create a shape here and uh, and then try and enlarge this. Um, and I've got this to try and focus on a sort of vector-based thinking. So if we look at what's going to happen to this point A when we enlarge it, well, I click it and I can get this vector here. And, you know, that vector is one negative three. And if I'm enlarging it by scale factor, let's say scale factor two, where's that going to go? And we think of that vector doubling. So you know, I can show that enlargement and then we can see, right, there's that vector one, negative three. If I click that point, I've got the vector two, negative six. And we can do that for all of these points and just see, right, we're multiplying by the scale factor. Um, and it, it's just there and, you know, you can you can move this around and change it and then just demonstrate what you like. 
Um, and then one of the things I was talking about on, on Saturday actually is if it's a bit overwhelming to be looking at a whole shape, why not just focus on a single point? Um, you know, reduce that cognitive load or whatever. Um, and then think, right, what is this vector, right? That's five, two. Um, where is the image of this going to be? Like, what vector do we need to go from this center of enlargement uh, if the scale factor is two? Um, and then you, know, you get, right, there we go, it's 10, 10, four. It's two times that vector. Um, and, and, you know, one of the nice things about thinking in terms of vectors is then that it's the same process, whether you're dealing with a scale factor greater than one that makes this thing, makes the shape bigger, or you're doing something between zero and one, or whether you're dealing with some negative, it's just multiplying by that scale factor. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sort of tries to address that problem where some students suddenly, you know, they, they feel like these are different things when you're, when you're making it bigger or making it smaller or doing the negative scale factor when you kind of get this rotation. And they don't really see that it's all really the same, same process. Mm. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's there's sort of hundreds of geodes on the site. I mean, I haven't even counted. Um, right, but lots yeah. of things, and there's there's lots more ideas I've got. I've got I've got a spreadsheet uh, with a list of things I want to add. It's just a case of getting around to doing them. Um, yeah. So. No, that's really. I mean, I didn't see. I wasn't at your presentation because. Um, so you know, this is this is new to me as well. This is really really good actually. Just that um, scaling of that vector, uh, what it looks like. Uh, it's an instant. I feel like we often as expert teachers or um, or expert mathematicians have this abstraction in our head. We already imagine it, what will happen, because we've, we see it in our head. But what what you've done there and what GeoGebra helps you do is make it really, really explicit. And that will then help the pupils have it abstracted out as well. So like, you know, and it's it's accurate it's really accurate because once you start getting into questions almost every question says not drawn to scale or something like that um except for these grid vector questions but almost all of it so then unless you've done plenty of stuff to scale um you can't abstract it to be not in scale so you know this is a great yeah great visualization um you could show it with a so that's a single point, and then you've got other shapes as well. So you could have pretty much any shape, right? You could. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, you well up to up to uh, uh, four uh, four sided. In, in this case, I mean, I could update it to have more. I think the um, rotation and reflection applets let you have have different different shapes. Um, where do we want those? Uh, I think. Are you you um you tutor is is it physics and chemistry as well as maths? Yes, yes, I do physics and chemistry up to and biology as well actually up to GCSE and then maths up to A level. So yeah, I do. Um, uh, am I allowed to ask you um, questions on this? Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a two way okay. process. Uh, uh, so actually, yeah. So reflection, by the way, you can. Uh, I've got one where you can just worry about reflecting a point uh, or you know reflecting a line segment before going into some shapes, you know, and then obviously you can edit these. Uh, but again, one of the other things, uh, hopefully I won't alienate too many people who did watch me on Saturday, but as, as a sort of scientist yourself, um, you know, you uh, this one I thought you might find interesting. Um, so I've got a reflection here. Do you, you know, you accept this is this is correct. There's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, it looks like a valid reflection of that triangle. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to trick you. Um, it's not, it's not a trick yeah, question, that's right, correct. okay. That's, that's, a, that's a correct reflection. Um, now, if I change this mirror line, this line of reflection, into a line segment like that, is that still correct? Is that allowed? Is that a sort of valid reflection? Well, if you're trying to represent the idea that there's a reflection happening along a line of reflection, then, well, that's a Yeah, I don't think so, because if you have a line segment, you don't have the line that's showing the reflection now. So yeah, in, in maths, what, I mean, we're always talking about that sort of perpendicular distance from each point of the object to the, to the line of reflection, and then you need to go that same distance to the other side. But we don't have this mirror here. So mathematically, we can't do this. Um, that's, that's wrong, mathematically. But sort of in a real world sense, or in terms of what a kid would learn in a science lesson, um, this finite mirror will give you that reflection. Um, I mean, I don't know if this is still in, in you know, uh, 
GCSE or if it's, if it's yeah, so. virtual and real images. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. 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 Um, so that reflection really is there in this finite mirror in sort of a real world sense or a sort of science lesson um, perspective, but it sort of goes against what we might do in maths. Uh, well, it's not really against because we don't, we never really do this. Um, but we talk about this perpendicular distance and that is what happens. But what the person sees is really kind of, this is what's going on with your kind of angles here and, and, and all of that. So it's sort of a nice link to, to make. I mean, I'll stop screen sharing, I guess, now unless there was more. Um, no, it's just, yeah, uh, I, I just, I'd like making links between between subjects, you know, whether it's maths and, and you know, the sciences or things like in English. I mean, yeah, you mentioned the vocab stuff that I, you know, I just find really interesting. Yeah, um, no, that's really, really neat. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought about that and often, often I have to like, uh, yeah, switch between my sort of science mode and maths mode and physics within the sciences as well with the physics mode and the chemistry mode. Um, but yeah, actually, one of the first things I do with my tutees with reflection is um, I just get pictures of landscapes uh, along like the, the water. And so I even yeah. take it out of maths and science. I just say, well, let's just, let's just look at some photography. What does this look good? And where is the mirror line? I, I won't even call it the line of reflection or line of symmetry or anything. I'll just call it the mirror. Where do you think? And uh, and I'll get the, a picture of the Taj Mahal, for example. And I say, well, where do you think the, the Taj Mahal is a, like a classic example of architecture where designed for symmetry and it's just places of symmetry. And, and then I'll extend the idea, they draw the line of symmetry and I'll say, well, let's say you are an architect and you wanted to add an extra pillar on this side of the Taj Mahal where will it where will its twin be on the other side and then gradually they get into this um so yeah it doesn't even have to be sort of maths or science it can be everything's interconnected in a like a, a web of uh, the architecture there's a design and it's really the natural world you know so um uh, yeah and i really like that i mean first of all just from a mathematical point of view very very nice um but then also, actually, if you teach a large enough class, you know, of, uh, you know, in, in, in a comprehensive school um, and it's not, say, a top set, it's, you know, that sort of question of cultural capital probably comes in. And there might be a fair few who don't know that it's the Taj Mahal. And, you know, I kind of think that's an opportunity to tell them what this thing is. Um, you know, it might never be important in their life. It might never, you know, it's not going to come up on an exam, but it's like... It's one of those things you, you think people should know what it is, right? Um, mm. And it's not just to say, oh, this is the Taj Mahal. You can then tell the story behind it. Like this, this was like a monument, uh, you know, like it's a, it's a story of love, isn't it? Um, yeah. This, this guy, Shah Jahan for his wife. Um, and you can tell them all kinds of things. And then you go like, where is this thing? And, you know, people might not even know which country it's in or which city it's in. And again, you, you share that with them. It might not stick, but for some it might and and they've got that little bit of little bit of you know something that is i think worth knowing in the world um by doing things like that yeah yeah i don't know i mean yeah there's there's so much that can happen from that actually i i might use it along with google earth pro because i teach one of my ways of forming rapport with my two t's um because i've been teaching so long now that my first cohort was pupils i knew in real life who i moved to teaching online but now i've been uh, I've got tutees all over the world that I will probably never meet because uh, they just live in they're all over the world. So one way for me to quickly like understand their world is just go on Google Earth Pro. It's a really sophisticated tool. You can uh, uh, like you can hover above their city. You can explore the architecture there. You can go into street view. You can walk around the streets and uh, like they always scream like, "Oh my God, this is my door! Like this is my street! This is where I live!" And uh, I'll do the same again with my street and then I'll show this is where I live. And, you know, you can do the path tool, which is work out the the distance, exact distance, uh, the great circle distance. Uh, what is a great circle? Then I have to explain why it's called a great circle, because that's the quickest path around the surface rather than if you cut deep through. So, you know, it just opens up all of these things. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily in the curriculum in any way, but it's uh, and then they I've had two Ts and say, oh, I want to see what the pyramids of Giza, can I find that on Google Earth Pro? And I had one that just looked it up and then realized, actually, this is, it looks much more different to the pictures I've been presented. Like when you kind of hover above it and go there and, 
and again the Taj Mahal is a great example because it was a uh, it was commissioned and the Mughal it's a it, it falls within the Mughal architecture they liked symmetry they liked order they liked uh, reflection so they use a lot of water and they you know the, the whole sort of culture behind it is a hot hot country to give that kind of cool cool feel uh, so uh, yeah it's good uh, could it, it goes into many places uh, and um, even with chemistry at the moment I'm using I've learned from maths that you can use these dot representations so um, instead of ball and stick diagrams which you can't have access to it online I've kind of just used these dots that you can join up as molecules and then se separate them out and then reform them and that's essentially chemistry you, you, you take something you break it apart and then you rejoin them and the, the, what you start off with is what you have to finish so that's uh, conservation of mass uh, and then there's moles and ratios um, but uh, every yeah, every GCSE student is doing the maths in maths as ratios and is doing the maths in chemistry as empirical formula and ratios as well so um, so, so it's a great way of linking all of these things up. Uh, so my personal request is, if you can do any of these linkage ones, um, so I would have never thought of that reflection along the along the line of symmetry. Um, if you can, I think it'd be, it'd be really such a good opportunity because uh, often we don't realize our pupils are learning all of these multiple things. So they, they may be learning about the Taj Mahal or the pyramids of Egypt and they may be, we don't know what they already know, like, um, but if there is any way in which you can have kind of this linking between the, the various aspects. Yes, that's my, my personal request, if I can get any of those. Well, I mean, even, I think the word, the form, the word formula is, is an interesting one because, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not a chemistry specialist and it's been decades, uh, but something like, so, so like H2O or CH4, uh, those, those are, that that would be a formula for like water or methane or something, right? Is that is that correct? Yeah, you could call it a chemical formula. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but but like in maths, you know, the formula needs two sides, doesn't it? It's it's it's, an, it's a special type of equation. Um, but in chemistry, you've got you've got equations in chemistry as well, right? But a formula is just a sort of a standalone thing. So um, yeah, it's just it's a, again, it's got a different sort of meaning. Um, it's sort of a little bit of a different meaning, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want a child to tell me pi r squared is a formula. You know, if they say like area equals pi r squared or area of a circle equals pi r squared, then that, that's the formula, mm. um, but not just pi r squared, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, a little, little it's the same with chemical equations. So that's why I would be very, I just said that's actually a chemical equation. And a chemical equation is a representation of a process. So it's, um, you know, hydrogen and oxygen combine together and they form water. So, and the symbolism is different. It's a forward arrow for this was before the reaction reagents, something happened. They actually broke down and disassoci disassociated and then reformed into a new molecule of water. Um, so yeah, in chemistry, you would use the idea of a molecular formula if it's covalent or a um, empirical formula, which is from experimentation and, and then the ratio but then you can link like empirical we call it empirical formula because it's a it's a practical thing and it's really what it means in this chemistry context is it's a ratio simplest ratio of things to join up and um again yeah just have to be just tell them it's a chemical equation and there's a mathematical so often i might be doing it in chemistry and i'll actually just go into maths and i'll say actually in maths the equal signs is different it means that you know this the idea of equality is either set something to be equal in a algebraic situation or it's uh, one side is equal to the other you can do some manipulations on both sides it has to be the same one and so on and so forth but in chemistry it's a completely different thing it is a chemical uh, equation which is a process uh, which may or may not be reversible in the same way as it is in maths like it can it may go both ways it may go one way 80% and the other way 20% it's like it's a different meaning um, yeah great so is there um, maybe you can go back on screen share is there anything else that uh, we could see on boss maths um, uh, well um, I guess uh, I guess we could uh, how do I do my screen share um, 
I mean, I guess there's a, there's a sort of little feature that nobody really seems to care about, but I'm sort of sort of disproportionately proud of, um, and that's just the, the sort of the search box, um, and it's just one of those things where you can search for something um, without necessarily knowing the exact title you're looking for, if that makes sense. Right. So um, if I if I want to say uh, sort of fraction division. Um, now the place where that turns up is applying the four operations to fractions. That sort of word fraction, uh, you know, division doesn't actually appear in the title, but it knows that that's one of the things you might be looking for. Um, mm -hmm. And then we've also got dividing algebraic fractions. But you know, just just sort of little things like that. Um, if you you know want to do, uh, you just type trig. All the trig things come up, even though say the sign rule that doesn't have trig in its title. So um yeah uh it was one of those things that was years ago uh just infuriating because you want to search for something and unless you know what it is you're trying to search for uh you kind of have to make a few attempts at, at finding finding what you want um no, it's really yeah. smart yeah no, it's presumably you kind of tagged it in some way with a with a way like the sign rule being tagged with trigonometry or trigonometry being tagged. So yeah, yeah. Kind of... So I mean, it's, it's nothing that clever, um, mm. but it's just a sort of a usability thing. And you know that it, it filters immediately. I mean, now I've just typed what we're looking for. Um, I guess uh, the other thing I've sort of been doing more of recently and I'm in the process of updating is um, there's lots of these sort of the same question generators that you get on top topics. Uh, they're sort of on the same page as, as the relevant um, sort of topic. Uh, so like here, you've got a load of slides on the sign rule, you know, you've got a video here, you've got exam style questions, you know, uh, different levels of exercise. Um, but you've then got these question generators on the same page. So if it's a kid that maybe wants to do something and get some feedback, they can. Um, and originally, these would just give them the question and the correct answer. But now, uh, I'm updating them so they give you the full working. Um, so, you know, you can drag it down. You've kind of got this color coding going on, um, you know, and you get the full kind of work. So, yeah, the angle P is 82.3 degrees. There's, there's our answer. Um, but it's also nice for a teacher. Um, I mean, uh, you, you know, you, you read a lot of, of these kind of things. Like, so backwards fading, um, it might be that, yeah, you, you do do some examples and you think, right, actually, I'm going to go this far and say, can you now rearrange it for me? Um, or maybe you go that far and say, just put that in your calculator. Like, can you do the last step? Um, and, and 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 yeah, and then sort of slowly just get get them to to do the whole thing for themselves. So yeah, guidance fading, um, some sort of stuff like that. Um, there's one, I think. Yeah, so really, really. Uh, I mean, there's quite a few, but there's sort of a one on compound compound interest and depreciation, this kind of thing, where you've kind of got, um, yeah, there we go. So, you know, you can keep generating new questions. Uh, you've got this scenario where there's that much money, that much interest, three years, hmm. you can sort of slowly reveal the answer, but then you can change the question. So it's the same scenario, but now instead of asking how much he has after three years, you kind of go, this is how much he has after three years. What was his original investment? Um, and then sort of reveal the answer as well. Or you can change it so you say, this is the original amount. This is what he ends up with. That's the interest rate. How many years um, was it? And then the other variant would be, you're given all the other information, but not the interest rate. How would you find the interest rate? So like these are all based on the same scenario, but different variants. So you can kind of really dig into what's going on and it's just saves you time for, from, from writing these from scratch in your own PowerPoint and, you know, doing a full work solution if that's what you want. Um, and then you can just generate more, um, you know, there's depreciation here as well. Uh, and you can have all these variants. Uh, I mean, like I say, I'm, uh, I'm not actually a big user of those. Um, I create them largely because people ask for them. Um, and, right. and I've got a load that I need to do. Um, but like I say, I'm, I'm a big handwriter. Um, my eyes glaze over when I see a lot of printed text. I don't know if this is something that other people get, but 
yeah, handwriting uh, sort of keeps me awake. Um, when I see a lot of text on a screen, it sort of puts me to sleep. So mm. uh, that's just me. But I think certainly with ones where there's sort of tricky diagrams, um, I'm not going to handwrite them. I'm not going to hand draw them. That's just just difficult, like you know, in geometry and, and things like that. So mm. stuff like this, yeah, is uh, something that's, that I get some demands for. Uh, polite, yeah. polite requests, I should say. Um, yeah, so I try try and do a load of those. No, it's really, really good. I mean, just got Paul Morgan on uh, Periscope commenting. Um, wasn't sure, wasn't aware of Boss Mass before this live stream. Some nice features. Thanks. Um, yeah, this no, is... I think I've seen. So he's he's one of your chemistry tutors. Like yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah, we do yeah. some chemistry work together. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I do, I do occasionally watch, and uh, just makes me feel bad because I did I did do A level chemistry, um, but like I say, it's such a long time ago, um, and I'm watching, thinking I don't remember this. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I did A-level chemistry as well, um, but and uh, I mean, I teach up to GCSE chemistry, and uh, the interesting thing about making those videos is um, I'm Paul's, in some ways, perfect test duty, because he teaches A-level chemistry, and uh, I supposedly know some A-level chemistry, but it's been so long, but at least because I teach GCSE chemistry, I could be a new GCSE test duty for him, so... And uh, we do these recordings and keep it completely organic. So I, I, I don't actually know what he's going to ask me. So, um, you know, um, I'm going uh, umming and eyeing and doing stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's really good. So obviously there's still people, I'm sure there's loads of people who haven't uh, heard of Boss Maths again. So this is a great opportunity. This I haven't seen this one actually, uh, this particular resource. So this will be quite useful for me. And, um, you know, I think as you've just made a teacher's workload a lot lighter because you've got that question you've got that flexibility you can change change the type of question within that sort of question you can change the variable you're looking for that's a very common thing isn't it so you want to make sure it's not just that same variable they're looking time and time again at at some point it will be when you want to build fluency and then that kind of variation but at some point you want to mix it up the variation um yeah i mean i think on, on that note there's you know like this is this is nothing uh uh, sort of ground groundbreaking either, but it's just uh, one of the early ones that was fairly popular. Um, something like this. So you know, if you want to share share in a given ratio, you kind of got both aspects of this going. You kind of got the sort of guidance fading. You can say, like, if that's what's happening here, you've got ratio one to three. How much are they going to have? You can sort of really give them a lot and just make them do the last step or whatever. But then you can kind of go back and say, right, what will happen if this is now 1,200, you know? Um, do they, are they going to realise instantly that it's just going to make them 10 times greater, you know, each of those answers? Or you kind of go, what if the ratio is now 1 to 4 instead of 1 to 3? Um, you know, how does that change things? Um, so you kind of got, yeah, the variation and the fading in, in one applet. Uh, and then, of course, there are different question types on this one as well. Um, so you can change it to this time amy gets 1200 so that's what's 1200 as opposed to the whole set of blocks right. here or i think she gets 1200 less than bob so that means that amount is the 1200 um and then you kind of have have the whole thing so you can demonstrate a lot um do the, do your variation you can sort of say right what if it's one to five and then and then do it without taking the time to produce a resource with these sort of, um, you know, questions where you're deliberately doing it. Yeah, I mean, you can do, there's nothing wrong. And, and with certain classes that actually might be ideal, but if you haven't got around to it, some of these, um, I tried to make it sort of easy to use. So like, there's not much in the way of instructions here, but you know, you drag the slider to show more and then that's the ratios. And this is just different sort of question variants. I mean, maybe a slider is the wrong sort of, UI element there, just maybe a question type, you know, one, two, three, four, or something. Mm. Um, but, but, you know, like it's just, you know, even if you are using this on an interactive whiteboard, it's just, you know, slide along and then just, yeah, go for this, you know, should be fairly self explanatory. That's, that's kind of the idea. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, there's another one down here. Yeah, that's that's really neat. That one actually, I haven't seen that ratio one, but there's so much of ratios you can just do that with one that one applet. I'm just looking at it straight away and like just 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 uh, yeah, okay, okay, got a lot of mileage in just that one. Yeah, um, I mean, just just lots of things. And then again, with the mini whiteboards, um, 
you know, once you've got them really fluid and they can sort of immediately see, right, if you, you know, what does changing this do to the answers? What does, you know, it's a bit trickier when you have sort of, dip, you know, you change both of these, you know, the, the red and the blue numbers. Um, but, you know, the option's there. Um, you know, you need to decide. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the other thing with variation is I've tried, tried a lot of these things where, you try to predict how many you're going to need of varying one one aspect before you then start varying something else. And with some classes, it might be it might be enough. Like they've they kind of got that they've, they've spotted what it is you want them to spot by varying that particular aspect. So then it's okay that the next question varies a different aspect. Mm. But that's hard to predict. Like sometimes they might not get what you're trying to get you know what you want them to get, and you've kind of run out of the questions you'd planned where you're changing that particular one. So for me, it always comes back to like, if I can, writing on a board, rubbing something out and changing the number. And I'll do that as, as much as I feel is necessary, um, which is great for sort of simple topics, you know, like rounding or something like that. I can write a decimal and change digits. Um, but for something like this, it's a bit of a pain to, to draw out lots of, I mean, maybe not actually, I can add on some boxes or about boxes. So for the more geometric ones, certainly though, it's, it's a pain to, to like hand draw and, have all of this going on so yeah yeah the, the GeoGebras um are useful i mean i'm a big big fan of GeoGebra, um but i still say it's not my default go-to but if they can be handy then then yeah definitely use them yeah no that is yeah this is really neat here yeah. and again i mean i do this as well on my i use bit paper where i do hand draw them but uh, like after a while it's don't wanna it's got a grid and everything but i don't want to be like drawing those many squares all the time so something like this is is there this immediate you can change and you can you can get that variation in and it's really very neatly designed because you've got the colors different as well like you know amy's got red and there's there's obviously you put some thought into this um whereas you know it could have just been all all black and white and um yeah yes yeah, there's, there's plenty in it this actually um yeah, all right. i mean so i mean i think that i've shown you um is like it's all, all stuff that's free i mean there is some sort of premium stuff but all the stuff i've shown you so far is is free there's no adverts on the site um i mean there's a sort of story behind that um i'm not really doing this as a business like i said this, this was sort of I was reluctantly pushed into this um but having been an accountant when i left teaching um i was sort of had had an idea in mind of you know things if you want if you want things to grow and do do things well you know funding is going to come into it somewhere and and a lot of the things that are free they you know they, they they're free because they're ad supported um or they're free because they're, they're doing something with user data um or they've got a lot of charity funding um that that is you know there's like a whole load of them have, have sort of got funding from from shine actually that are quite well well known um and it's you know uh I don't know if you if you're, you're probably not uh, into into motorsport or anything, but I think I don't know if this is a true sort of quote, but uh, Enzo Ferrari uh, was talking about Ferrari sell cars so they can go racing, like that's what they want to do. Whereas um, a lot of car manufacturers they go racing in order to sell cars. It's a marketing exercise for them, um, and I mean I don't. I, you know, I, I don't really push a lot of things on the site. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm sort of add something onto the site every day. I don't tweet about every resource um, and I don't really aggressively push anything on Twitter really. And and oh, I don't think I do. Um, and when I do share things, um, normally it's just stuff that's free. Um, so, you know, the, the premium stuff exists so that I can keep running the site rather than the other way around. Um, and yeah, I mean, maybe it's a, it's a sort of foolish way of being, um, and that people ask me like, oh, why don't you just put ads on it? Um, and the thing with that is I've got no problem with adverts, for advertising at adults. Um, but I was very uneasy. It's sort of, this was like, again, back in 2014, 15, um, there were some resources out there that were coming out that were really good, but they were ad supported and they were for children. Um, and I was just really uneasy about about sort of sharing those um, and speaking to an English teacher actually. So not one of the maths, one of my maths colleagues, but she just called me like you just a quixotic moron for caring about that because 
kids are going to expose themselves to ads anyway on the internet. Um, so what difference does it make? Mm. And that was one of the things that actually got me on that. I was thinking, you know what? I've got no right to complain about that if I'm not offering a better alternative or an alternative. Um, mm. So um, that's this is just one of the things for me, like, I don't mind if nobody uses the site at all. Like, I mean, hopefully people are and they're finding it useful. And I mean, I know they are because I can see the traffic. Um, but also there's sort of two or three sources of sort of good child focused resources that are, you know, they've got like YouTube ads turned on. And I just, you know, I hope once I've got sort of all the videos on the site done um, mm. and they'll all be ad free, um, I'll be in a bit more of a position to sort of say, you know what, you guys might want to be um, turning ads off. Um, you know, you shouldn't be advertising to children. That's just a personal view. Um, and, you know, if they want to, that's fine. Um, but if not, I'm offering an alternative. So I'm not just sort of complaining about something and, and not doing anything about it. Uh, so, yeah, so went off on a bit of a tangent there. Yeah, yeah. no, no, absolutely. This thing is, uh, I mean, I work in, a, I suppose, a highly capitalist world of uh, tutoring and bit paper and ed tech and things. Um, and, you know, these things, there's server costs, there's time, uh, even my live streaming. I mean, I, I need to pay for Zoom to get this kind of group call and uh, restream.io this is the multi streaming software so yeah i'm on a subscription for that you know all of these things cost so yeah the, uh, the very bare minimum you can recoup that cost through uh, whatever what whatever you think is best uh, it can be advertising it can be a subscription one um so but, yeah so there are different models but like that's the one i chose i sort of felt yeah i had this sort of financial melts um background like i didn't need a separate accountant to do sort of the initial setup and things like that so it's just a kind of you know tiny little you know company at the end of the day um and anyone who does subscribe they do a lot to support the site they make it much easier for me to to mm. sort of feel like yeah this is really worth you know just keep making stuff um and, and pushing it but i mean i do it mostly for the love of it uh like i say i don't you know there's there's lots of amazing really good stuff out there and, and a lot of it probably might suit certain schools in certain circumstances a lot better i'm not saying that it's definitely right that every single person should be using boss maths but if you've never checked it out, there might be a lot of things that would help you out, I guess. Um, particularly if you like using mini whiteboards. I know I know schools aren't exactly in a normal state of, of sort of being right now. Um, people are going back. But yeah, um, the GeoGebras, uh, if you like mini whiteboards, uh, I think it's, it's a pretty good place to go on the internet if you like these sort of visualizations. Um, yeah. It's one of, one of the good places to go, and and like I said, those those are free, um, and you know, there's no login, there's no friction um, to yeah. access well, uh, those. If you're offered, I'd love to see some of the premium part of the of the website and what what else is out there, and just for people to get a preview and for me to get a preview as well, just to see what else is uh, yeah, what else is out there. Okay, uh, so uh, it's not terribly sexy, um, but it's. You, you know, you kind of get these slides uh, with, with a load of questions. Um, but if you are a premium one, you kind of get diagnostic questions sort of embedded into the slides, uh, which these get hidden. Um, uh, and there's sort of some with, with more than others. They get hidden. So like that's just a sort of extra little thing there. You get all of these sort of teacher resources um, as a premium subscriber. So you can, I'm actually in the process of adding these into PowerPoint. So you can download these as PowerPoints sort of by the end of the summer because had just loads of people asking for that. Um, for me, because I never used PowerPoint, I never made these in PowerPoint, um, and converting them is a bit of a pain, or sort of a lot of the maths formatting gets messed up, so it's a bit of a job. Uh, so an unwise move on my part, not using PowerPoint to start with. But you can have, you'll, you'll be able to download the slides in PowerPoint. At the moment, you can download them as PDFs. Then you've got a worksheet that's basically that, but formatted for A4 with space for working. You've got a handout, so it's basically the same thing again, but compressed so it's not a lot of printing if that's what you want mm. uh, you've got a full work solution so like that's kind of a big reason why someone might want to subscribe and then there's a load of additional resources um some have more than others links to more um more things like that uh you've got links to like past paper questions sort of color coded ish by difficulty and things on ukmt so like if you click on um one of these it should just open uh I'm in Firefox, which is a bit of a pain. But if you open it in Chrome, um, it should open to the right page. Mm. Um, 
in the next tab. So there's that. Uh, you know, you've got um, sort of in the real world, um, little sort of little factoids, some are better than others. You've got this whole enrichment course here, um, which is a sort of premium feature. Um, so like this one, uh, I think I put out around the time of the general election. Um, so yeah, it's just about manipulating, manipulating um, elections and there's sort of a load of activities here that you can do uh, talking about differences between words like majority and plurality. You know, it's like, it's like a lot of adults don't necessarily get these right. Certainly if Twitter is anything to go by. Uh, I don't know if you've got any kind of a, an economics background, but there's, you know, different types of voting system can take the same sort of group of people with the same preferences, but you get different outcomes based on different voting systems. So mm -hmm. you've kind of got yeah. these. Um, and there's sort of lots of sort of interesting activities that you can do. So there's there's a handout for students to work on as, you know, to go with these slides. There's uh, teacher notes, um, which I'll open this PDF here. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably won't share because... It's only sharing my Firefox, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's on right. Firefox at the moment. Yeah, yeah. But there's sort of detailed um, teacher notes to go with it. So, like, even if you don't necessarily know um, what's what's what, uh, I'll tell you what. Can I sh change what I'm sharing if I stop? Yeah, you can have a. Um, yeah, no, that's really again sort of functional. Uh, yeah, like you've got all the slides and. It sort of tells you how you might want to talk through each of these, what's going on, um, and and what 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 to sort of tell the students to do with with that handout. Um, you know, we talk about transitivity and, and and sort of ideas that are relevant in maths, and then sort of we've got first past the post, tongue parliaments, what goes on in America, um, and then a bit on gerrymandering. So there's a there's a sort of little geogebra on there. If I bring back Firefox. Um, so just something like this, if you've got a simple plurality voting system, uh, who wins here out of red and blue? Uh, I can't even count. I think that's blue, isn't it? One, two, three. Four, yeah, at the bottom, yeah. Yeah, blues win. Um, if you've kind of got a constituency system with certain boundaries, mm. um, blue still wins in this case, because blue wins two out of three. Yeah, right. But if you like have the same same voters, but change the boundaries, now red is going to win two out of three, um, so it's just a sort of quick illustration of, of little ideas like that. So there's there's lots of lots of these um, you know things about infinity, things that you wouldn't necessarily do as part of a GCSE. Uh, imaginary numbers. There's a sort of geometry in there. I've got a um, time with Newton and Einstein. <clears throat> uh, yeah, if we go to that one, there's a sort of. I mean, you you'll know this stuff, I guess. Uh, there's there's basically a bit of special relativity going on here. Uh, with this applet, uh, what's going on if Alice rolls this ball? Um, what does Alice see? What does Bob see? How long does it take? Mm, yeah, yeah. That kind of thing. Um, and we can kind of do this uh, where Alice is now traveling. The train is moving as well, and Alice is rolling the ball backwards at the same speed as the train is moving forwards. So mm. this ball is kind of in line with that tree, and it, it looks stationary to someone like Bob. Um, mm. so, I mean, I'm rushing through this, but, you know, we've got that. And then we've eventually we've got um, the speed of light involved in here. We've got six billion meters between these two trees. I don't know if you can read that on your Zoom. Yeah, yeah test about, yeah. But you've got this light that's going off at the speed of light, like, and, and you know, so there's, there's length contraction coming into here. And again, like, you know, not every teacher might be familiar with this stuff, because, um, I mean, it's not in maths. Um, uh, at least at school level maths, um, but it's super interesting. And I, I'm almost like, how can a kid get to 16 and not necessarily be exposed to things like just the basic idea of, you know, in, in quantum quantum mechanics and and sort of relativity. Um, so you've got this, and like I say, the teacher notes here hopefully provide enough to support anyone, even if you've never come across it before as a teacher. Um, but things that you can do. Um, you know, lots of questions you can ask and, and, and go through hmm. um, questions like this. You've kind of got, I think I've got Zeno's paradoxes in here somewhere, uh, or maybe it's in one of the other ones. Um, yeah, I think that's in one of the other ones. Uh, yeah, so so there's that. Um, there's some 
some of these mixed topic materials which have uh some of these these questions so um, i quite like uh some of these what i call shortcut questions um here's I mean, this is one that I shared on Saturday, um, but it's just one. It goes back to, you know, you were talking about the mean where for some students, the mean is just a sort of, it's a method. It's not, it doesn't have any meaning. Um, yeah. Like this one is for, for people who've only got an understanding of gradient that is based on a formula. So it's like either rise over a run or, mm. you know, you're like Y1 minus Y2 and X1, X2, whatever you call it. Um, they're really going to struggle with this. Um, but someone who sort of appreciates gradient where they kind of go, okay, a gradient of two means every time you go one unit to the right, hmm. you're going to go two units up. Yeah. It means they can see here, right. So if I'm going one unit to the right there, this is going to mean I'm going two units up. So they get, oh yeah, it's 9.238. They just get it. Um, the formulaic kids are going to be substituting this and they're going to be dealing with these nasty decimals and, trying to work out something using some formula for gradient. Um, so yeah, so questions, these sort of, yeah, there's a lot of these that try and encourage thinking in terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of. No, it's really, really good actually. It's really, really good. Yeah, so there's a whole series of these. Mm. Um, no, I think uh, you've, you've thought, yeah, you've thought very, very well about it. I mean, it's really, um, yeah, I will definitely check it out, especially, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, all the physics stuff, obviously, it's, it's all kind of interlinked, very interesting. Uh, the thought experiments uh, can drive you crazy sometimes, like when the futils are first introduced to the idea of uh, time dilation and, uh, and the speed of light and mass tending towards infinity and all those things. But uh, yeah, there's no reason why they can't be introduced to it and at least the idea of it. Uh, and the mass is a tool that... Theoretical physicists like Einstein would have used experimental physicists as well. You know, it's just a tool they would have used with all these things. Um, yeah, I mean, so I had, I mean, I know you, you've kind of got to wrap it up, haven't we, in a minute or so, but um, those, I used a sort of earlier version of those myself with uh, some classes of mine, sort of top sets, and it was outside of school. Um, and it was sort of an after school thing where I sent out letters and said, right, your child has been selected to, to sort of come to these maths enrichment sessions. And when you, as soon as you say they've been selected, they want to come um, and others want to join in. I say, oh, can I join in? And you say yes. Whereas if you kind of just advertise it as I'm, I'm running some maths enrichment sessions, you know, no one turns up. Um, but I did this and it was for sort of year 10s and 11s, mainly just to sort of give them an extra reason to stay and do A-level maths. Like, I know, again, that isn't A-level maths that I was doing with them, but I was just trying to, get them enthusiastic about maths and show them things that I couldn't necessarily justify spending normal lesson time on. Um, but show them, like, these, these are so many cool things that are going on out there. I mean, you know, we've got climate modeling, we've got, you know, time travel, we've got, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, and yeah, like, why not? Um, so yeah, that was, so I have used all of those um, with, with students for that reason. Um, and I mean, it's very hard to judge like what effect it had. Like, did it did it make the difference between a child thinking, yeah, that's going to make me do a level maths when maybe I wouldn't have done, or that's going to make me stay at this school rather than go off to another sixth form because that was another sort of um, thing that we wanted to do. We wanted to retain our best students um, and not have them go off elsewhere. Um, yeah, I'm sure every little thing, every little like uh, extension thing, you just never know. I sometimes hear back from Tutti's parents like many years later that, you know, there's this bit of this thing you did that was a turning point. And then they decided that they wanted to do this or that or that instead, or like go into engineering or go into, they started liking maths and started exploring this idea. So, you know, you just don't know. You just don't know what you're doing. Or like it's going to compound many, many years later. Like in, in the moment, it feels like we're doing this thing, but uh, I think we should never as teachers <laughs> underestimate this compounding effect. Like we are, that's why we're, we're into doing what we're doing. Like it's, it's a lifelong change uh, at a very early stage. You can help people uh, appreciate maths. Become, really, it's about 
uh, tapping into natural human curiosity like we are all very very curious individuals we're born curious we remain curious and just tapping into that and getting them to generate their own lines of inquiry and kind of exploring from there so whatever you do that's really fantastic things and yeah, it just can't, doesn't have to I mean, be yeah. Yeah. I can pinpoint like there's a handful of moments that I can pinpoint that the sort of things that my teachers did you know when I was sort of 12 13 14 like throughout my school like just a few but it was there were sort of real big light bulb moments so they changed my relationship with maths um because when I was younger like I felt like I was good at it just because I was getting questions right and you know relative to my peers that was always the case but it wasn't something it wasn't a subject I necessarily enjoyed until like I kind of got the right teacher who did things in, in a certain way and you know uh one sort of led me Rob Easterway's book Why the Bus is Coming Threes um and all of a sudden I was like wow this stuff is cool like um you know that was one that was like the first of, of, of a handful of moments yeah yeah I know and you can just tell from your enthusiasm and you know as people as human beings the children particularly are very very tuned into like is the teacher enthusiastic about this thing is they enthusiastic about that subject you can just tell from all the and the way you speak the way you present yourself that this is something you're really enjoying and if you're really enjoying it they enjoy it once they start getting at a level of success and understand it makes sense to them uh, and they're extremely sensitive to this thing and they, they can they can tell when someone doesn't want to be there and is doing it for the sake of doing it and it's going through the motions and things um you know especially in this sort of tutoring world uh, often it's after school you know they already have had a full day of school and um you know you really have to like zing zing the energy into the whole thing um yeah brilliant so yeah, we've come to a little bit more than an hour um and if uh yeah if people want to know more i suppose uh you can just put it on twitter and they can uh, uh possibly just find you through boss maths on the on the website and um i'm sure you've got plenty of new stuff coming and um yeah so again um any kind of last thoughts for teachers teachers maths teachers or yeah, anyone in general like uh uh, I mean, uh, just, I know everyone's working so hard and just doing a fantastic job. And I think it's one of those, it doesn't get said enough. Um, uh, well, it's at least not on Twitter. Um, there's, there's, you know, certain controversial figures, should we say, who uh, uh, seem to like a bit of teacher bashing. But, you know, uh, I think a lot of people do realise, but don't necessarily say, or it doesn't get said enough. So, you know, I don't know if there'd be any sort of non-teachers watching, um, but... You know, everyone needs to know that people are doing a brilliant job um, and working just so hard in difficult circumstances. And it's so hard to plan ahead. Um, so yeah, just just schools, teachers, head teachers. Um, I mean, I'd hate to be a head teacher right now. Um, I mean, I think it wouldn't suit me anyway. Um, but right now, I mean, they're just just doing incredible incredible work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we we did a live stream yesterday, and I think this is one of the times parents have uh, had to homeschool their children and um you know like finding the beginning to really appreciate what teachers in schools do you know like teaching one child or two children at home is so challenging it's so difficult and then um they're beginning to re- hopefully appreciate how difficult it is for teachers to like teach what 30 children at a time you know it's um if anything what this has hopefully done is um got parents uh besides the sort of teacher bashing by some sections of the media or to a twitter or whatever but really i mean parents have uh I've, i'm speaking to a lot of parents and they've really got a whole new level of respect for the teaching system and an appreciation so uh, it's one of the things i think um yeah we can appreciate and take away from this uh these times um so yeah again thanks so much for your time uh Sadeep, and um yeah i really appreciate you spending the time here and this video will be on twitter so you can replay anyone can replay it. it'll be there'll be a copy on youtube as well and it's on my facebook page so um people can just watch it again and um hopefully we can do we can do another one in some point in the future i'm doing i'm completely committed to doing this like one or two a week so uh so going through uh, people i admire sometimes people just ask me so if you want to go live yeah that's all you can just message me and um i hope to yeah hope to catch you again in person or online yeah whenever i'm sure we'll meet in person because we're, we're both based in london here yeah. yeah um well i should be the one thanking you it's been been an absolute pleasure really um 
And yeah, it's always nice to just, just chat, isn't it? Um, yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure. So I'll uh, just switch the live stream off and then we can uh, have a quick debrief and uh, yeah.